On the steps of this general post office on Easter Monday, 1916, Patrick Pierce announced to a crowd of Dubliners that on that day, a new Irish Republic was born. And with that, an uprising against British rule had begun in what would later become known as the Easter Rising. This post office served as the headquarters for the rebels, either because of its strong, thick walls or because a few rebels had some Amazon packages coming in. Either way, it's a solid choice. Everyone knows the second most important rule of a good republic is a solid set of white pillars. First rule being annoying political ads. In fact, you can still see bullet holes in said pillars over a hundred years after the uprising, which were definitely left there to make them look cool. Kind of like the ripped jeans of architecture. The rebels went on to capture many other strategic buildings on O'Connell Street, including a wireless telegraph station where they sent out the first radio broadcast in Ireland, a Morse code message announcing their new nation, which, compared to other countries, is a pretty metal first transmission. America's was a combination of poetry, violin music, and Bible readings, which was undoubtedly played to the horror of thousands of Midwestern Catholic kids. The Easter Rebellion lasted six days and resulted in the unconditional surrender of the Irish freedom fighters, but it sowed the seeds for an independent Ireland that would come in the following decades. But this video will not be a deep dive into that very fascinating and complex story. For that, I recommend Extra Credit's fantastic series on it. Instead, we're going to do things a bit more Blue Jay. So here are some obscure, unimportant, but fascinating stories about the Easter Rising of 1916. The rising involved brutal artillery strikes on civilians, suicidal bayonet charges, and the execution of bystanders suspected to be rebels. So it shouldn't be all that surprising to hear that, during the six-day insurrection, ceasefires were not very common. But not impossible. For the rebels and Brits, there was one thing so important that even the bloody struggle for freedom had to be put on hold. Ducks. Here at St. Stephen's Green, the volunteers of the Irish Citizens Army and the British soldiers held a daily ceasefire so that the weirdly dedicated park keeper, James Kearney, could come out and feed the ducks. Now, was this an act of wholesomeness and humility between two factions, or were both sides just afraid of provoking an escalated response from the O'Quack militia? We may never know. But if there's one thing I've learned from talking to both Brits and Irish, it's that they don't fuck with the ducks. And if you find this story ridiculous, you know what they say. No war has ever been waged without its fair share of quackery. As a quick side story, there's an award called the Freedom of the City of Dublin that numerous iconic historical figures have received, such as Eamon de Valera, Barack and Michelle Obama, and Bono. The honor comes with many perks, such as being able to vote in some elections, and even the right to pasture their sheep on the common grounds, including here at St. Stephen's Green. Perhaps a rather dated perk, but nonetheless a right that Bono wasted no time in exercising. However, in the ancient privileges and duties, there is a provision that stipulates freed men slash freed women must defend the city and could be called into the militia at a short notice. So, if you ever start another rising in Dublin, there is a non-zero chance that you would face Obama and Bono on the battlefield. Before the Easter Rising began, the Military Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood sought out German aid for their planned uprising. Seeing as how the Germans were currently engaged in this little disagreement with the Brits, they happily supported Irish independence, agreeing to a wee bit of gun smuggling for the Irish freedom fighters. So on April 6, 1916, Germany dispatched the gun-stuffed SS Liebau to Ireland and disguised it as a Norwegian vessel to avoid capture, which is becoming somewhat of a common theme on this channel. After powering through a violent storm like a champ, it successfully reached its destination of Shirley Bay. This isn't Shirley Bay, this is Hoth, that's all the way on the other side of the island, and I'm scared to drive on the left side of the road. But I figured this is also water, and it doesn't matter, because I'm the best sight in this frame anyway. However, there was a slight hiccup. There wasn't anyone to meet them there. The Lee Bao had arrived on Thursday, April 20th, but the Irish nationalists weren't expecting to meet them until Easter Sunday, April 23rd. And in Ireland, there's a saying for this kind of conundrum. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. But to be fair, the Germans were reading maps in Norwegian and didn't have a working radio, so I think just arriving at the right spot at all is deserving of a pat on the back. Without a working radio to inform them of the updated meeting date, there they sat, twirling their thumbs. Or pretzels, or whatever Germans do to pass the time. But they wouldn't have to wait too long, because soon enough, three Royal Navy destroyers closed in on the masquerading German vessel. And in Germany, there's a saying for this kind of conundrum. Oh shit, oh fuck, I'm screwed. So instead of allowing the weapons to fall into British hands, the Germans scuttled the ship. Which, unfortunately, doesn't mean it sprouted little crab legs and ran its way up the beach to Dublin. It means it detonated charges and sank the ship down to Leprechaun Jones's locker. Ireland would finally claim independence after the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, becoming the Irish Free State. 
which is a little misleading because while yes, they were self-governing, they still had the British King George V as the head of the state. Honestly, a good rule of thumb is that whenever you see adjectives in a state's name, assume the opposite. The United States has nothing united about it, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is none of those things, and the Isle of Man actually totally delivers. So the word free in Irish free state should be taken with a grain of salt. It wouldn't be until 1949 when Ireland would officially be declared the Republic of Ireland, breaking off all ties with the Commonwealth. But unfortunately, they still wouldn't be able to break ties with the UK's weather. 